I'm Michael Ford. I work with Aegis Software, um, but more recently I'm very active with IPC. And as part of the IPC standards, of course, 2581 is now a key focus of interest. Uh, for me, myself, I'm very much into promoting smart factory operation, industry 4.0 for the future. And, you know, it's often neglected about what is needed from the, the design side in order to make Industry 4.0 possible. Because you, you actually can't do Industry 4.0 unless you have a method of getting data from design through to manufacturing extremely quickly and without any mistakes. Real revolutions, of course. Now, normally, we talk about that after they've happened. <laughs> this time, we're looking ahead a little bit. Um, but the third industrial revolution involved the creation of automatic machines. And those machines powered by electricity, for example. And that's what we see today in most factories. We see robots, we see S&T machines. Those are all Industry 3.0 machines. They're automated processes. Industry 4.0 sits above that in the way that it is controlling and optimizing all of the automated processes so that they can become very flexible and yet optimized as they are focused on the changing customer demand. And it's the changing customer demand that has really driven Industry 4.0. In the past, we used to make a plan for manufacturing that would last a month, three months, six months. We would know what we were doing. It's like a grandfather clock. It had a, you know, a purpose and it would keep on running. Today, Manufacturing has to change day by day to meet the changing customer need. And so normal operation of a factory will become very inefficient in doing that because products assigned to a particular line, that line rate will never match the customer demand. So if the customer demand is 800 and the line capability is 1000, you've lost 20% productivity right there. But you have to have the 1000 capability in case the customer changes their mind. It takes so long with legacy engineering methods to move a product from one line configuration to another that it's simply not done. Manufacturing accepts that loss. We can't do that in Industry 4.0. If the customer says, today we want 800, then we move the product to a line that runs at 100% efficiency, making 800. And then the faster line we assign to another customer. That means the product is moved from one configuration to another configuration very quickly. 2581 allows us to create a digital product model within one file. And we can quickly, in our engineering systems, choose the line configuration for today and create the necessary data for those machines. Now, in the past, you would have, as Hamant was saying earlier, you would have different files, pictures, drawings, whatever, and you would give them all to the various machine vendors. And you'd say, you do this, you do this, you do this, and talk to each other and try and get it done. A week later, maybe you had a program on a line ready to run. You can't do that day by day. So having a single product model into a digital manufacturing engineering engine then allows you to choose the configuration day by day or even hour by hour, because it takes just a few minutes to convert that digital product data into a running SMT line. The data for all of manufacturing is contained within that file. Now, there are various elements that different machines will require. And so whether it's the location of components, component shapes and geometries, whether it's test points or anything like that, you could say it's a kind of a translation. It's a, you choose which machine in the line will perform each task, and then you allocate the data accordingly. But what you mustn't forget is that the line isn't only machines. There are people also doing manual assembly operations. And so the 2581 file includes the base information with which to create documentation, such that when we assign jobs to manual operators, I mean, which typically today in a modern factory will be you know, using paperless operation with lots of little videos in there to show exactly how things are done, we want to make sure that we reference the exact 
design intent as part of that documentation. So that there's no kind of challenge as to, well, this document shows this, but this document, it seems different. That happens today. But it all comes from the same source. Through 2581, it's the same consistent data. The real challenge is to make sure that the de designer's intent is captured and that should any modifications be made, that A, they are consistent with the designer's intent and also that we have information fed back to the designer. So at the moment, if people are using the Gerber and making manual editing on that, there's no tr track of reference. You don't know what somebody did. If something then later goes wrong, who has the responsibility? Very, very difficult to go back. We now, I mean, one example is that, you know, you have many products these days where you have a lot of different vari variations. Some of those variations are driven by the features of a particular product. Some of them are driven by cost performance, you know, redu reducing the cost, exchanging materials or changing layouts a little bit. So I understand how these kind of uh, changes are made. And to save time, okay, you can implement them within manufacturing. But there needs to be a clear audit trail. With 2581, you've got the original digital content. And by editing that original digital content, you could then create the record of that change being happened. I mean, this is all subject to manufacturing and customer relationships, because in many cases, it should be spun back to the original designer. But for example, where materials to be used are obsolete, and you need to substitute a different material with a different package shape, so you have a different land pattern, you need to change the design. Does that go back to the designer who forgot about this design two years ago. And, you know, it's going to take a long time for him to get back up to speed. Yeah, he may not be there. He may not, yeah, exactly. And, or could we modify it locally and just do it, just get it done. But let's get it done in a way that we've got traceability so that everybody can understand that this has happened and can approve it, can see it. I think that is the answer. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the really great thing about 2581 is that it is an XML format, which means that a human can read it and a system can read it. And so you can very quickly see if somebody were to change it, then you can see where the change is and you can, un you can then sort of put a, a record to say who changed it and how it was changed. But, you know, tools in manufacturing could also re-output a 2581 and then you would be able to see the version difference. One thing that you have to remember is that the Gerber data isn't the design data. Uh, I mean... Yeah, it's a, a graphical output. No. Well, yes, it is, but it's a graphical output that's intended for use in fabrication. So the actual outlines of things, I mean, even these kind of uh, fragments of design that you're talking about, they aren't necessarily part of the original design. Yeah. When creating the Gerber, it adds in various elements to compensate for the manufacturing process. This actually introduces errors and potential mistakes. So this is kind of like a correction process for that. With, twi with 2581, there should not be these kind of issues. And if there are, the designer needs to be called to task. But you should find that 2581 data is clean and immediately usable. First of all, we feel that uh, quite a bit of time has gone on since 2581 was originally created. And I have to say that the people who originally created the idea, it was good for the time it was created. Now it's not good. It's an absolute necessity. Because of this Industry 4.0, which Aegis as a company is promoting. I mean, we work with IPC um, for the Connected Factory Exchange, where we want to have a complete and open bi-directional IoT communication directly with all of the machines. No intermediate software or anything like that, no middleware, anything like that, but direct access to fully functional information. And that drives Industry 4.0 because we believe that the software tools that people will need in the future are those which will make the factory flexible and will be able to control and manage and augment decisions being made, for example, to change the schedule or move a product from one line to the next. People will continue to make those decisions. Our people in manufacturing who have that skill and experience will always be required. But 
they will make better decisions and much faster decisions if they can see all of the information. But you know, it's completely useless if these people come along and say, I can really improve the factory productivity by 30 or 50 percent if we do this and this and this and this and this and this. I can see the data, I understand what to do, but my design data is fixed on this machine. My, I, I don't have the flexibility to, to move this out. We are, as part of IPC, uh, making the best practices um, for digital manufacturing in the future. And so it starts with 2581. You then need to select an engineering tool which can take the 2581, create that digital product model. And for example, what we do in our software is to say, you know, I'm not going to fix the configuration. I'm going to look at the product model, understand what is needed, separate things out into logical processes, and be ready. I'm now ready for a decision to put this particular product onto a particular line configuration. I'm also ready, for example, where I have maybe a hundred variants of a different product. I can simply select the variant I want and say that variant, that line, this variant, this line, this quantity. And I can simply do that. That kind of engineering tool can then create the specific engineering outputs for all of the particular machines at a moment's notice and be able to say, right, this is the plan we think we need for today. Everybody's happy. Go and just execute. Yeah, the, the market has changed significantly um, because the problem was always how do you optimize an SMT machine? Um, <clears throat> do you use an external software um, to be able to look at the line and then make the optimization? But then you send the programs to the machine and they have to change, and then you end up with a line that's not balanced. That kind of operation has almost disappeared now. What the machine vendors can offer in an industry 4.0 environment is to be able to make a very high level of sophisticated optimization, not just for this product that we're making, right. but what is the next one coming, and the next one, and the next one. Where are my common factors for my feeder setups? The machine vendor knows best of all how to do that, but what they don't have until now is the reliable information with which to do that. And the reason for that is because it used to take so long to get all of the information sorted out, corrected, revised, checked, signed off, trials done with 2581, you don't do any of that. You simply have the data, you know it's correct, you send it out, and the machine vendors can optimize their own environment. Today, that's a luxury. It, it's a feature that many machine vendors offer, and it, it provides a better support. In the future, when we're all industry 4.0, that is essential. Nobody will be able to not do that.